the diversity of organisms found in this planet because of the alteration in genes in them or because of different sets of genes present in them we call it as the genetic diversity if in a parent the mutated dna is there either in the mother or the father that mutated dna can pass on to the offspring as well himalayan region organisms are completely different the plant is completely different when compared to the desert region and a warm welcome to today's session on environmental studies for second semester bca i'm dr divya environmental studies faculty vidyashram first grade college temple of excellence mysore so in today's session let us continue with studying unit 4 that is biodiversity and conservation so talking about biodiversity so what is this biodiversity so biodiversity meaning bio meaning life diversity is the differences so the differences or the variety of life forms that exist on this planet we can call it as the biodiversity so therefore biodiversity is all the different kinds of life you will find in one particular area so the definition of biodiversity is it is all the different forms of life that you can find in one particular area next talking about the levels of biodiversity so we can study biodiversity under three different levels that is genetic diversity then we have the species diversity and the ecosystem diversity so let us study each of these one by one so talking about genetic diversity the name itself suggests genetic it has something to do with the genes so the diversity of organisms found in this planet because of the alteration in genes in them or because of different sets of genes present in them we call it as the genetic diversity so the variation in the genetic composition among species of a population is defined as genetic diversity so talking about the importance of genetic diversity why should genetic diversity occur in nature so the amount of diversity is at the genetic level especially is very important because it represents the raw material for evolution and adaptation that is by looking at the genes by looking at the number of times the genes have repeated in an organism we can study what type of evolution or how many years the organisms has undergone evolution so that is why it is very important or say for example our dna usually tends to mutate because of many reasons right so say for example in the parent there is a mutated dna so mutated dna means actually what gene should have been there that will get altered so that is called as mutated dna so if in a parent the mutated dna is there either in the mother or the father that mutated dna can pass on to the offspring as well so we will understand how many generations this particular organism has been there and for how many generations it has been living in this planet so therefore for evolution and adaptation techniques or for adaptation so that was about evolution adaptation so for adaptation also organisms tend to change their gene say for example we have evolved from the monkeys or the apes right do we think do you think we'll have all the genes that the apes would have had no it's changed there will be some alteration wherein we will have some type of genes which is not found in the monkeys so that is why we are different from the monkeys though we have evolved from the monkeys we have evolved from the monkeys because of the change in the genes therefore we are what we are today the present day human beings right so therefore it represents the raw material for evolution as well as adaptation or we can say the dolphins the dolphins and the sharks to look they are quite same but actually they are two different species entire different species why they they genetic variation actually genetics all actually varies the dolphins have flippers whereas the sharks do not so like that it just tends to vary 
so talking about or we can talk about the reptiles that is say for example the simple wall lizard or the house lizard if we consider and the snakes the snakes also belong to reptiles the uh, lizards also belong to reptile and almost the lizard looks like a snake itself but what is the major difference there snakes do not have limbs the lizards have limbs right so that is because of genetic variation so likewise genetic variation gives rise to a lot of different species of organism and more genetic diversity in a species or in a population of species means greater ability for some of the individuals in it to adapt to changes in the environment genetic diversity is very very important for a particular organism to adapt to its particular environment say for example i told you snakes earlier it was said that according to the evolutionary evidences it was said that the snakes had limbs or legs but trying that is running very fast to escape from the predators eventually led to the loss of legs and that is how the snakes just crawls now very very fast so that is how in order to adapt to that particular environment or for example frogs it is enough for the frogs to have just gills right but they also have a moist skin they also have a lungs for respiration why because frogs are capable of living on land so when they are on land they can respire through skin and through lungs when they are in water they can respire through gills so that is how organisms they alter their genes in order to adapt to that particular environmental condition so therefore more genetic diversity in a species or in a population greater the ability for some of the individuals to better adapt to that particular variation in the environment and survive and less diversity leads to uniformity so what happens if there is uniformity say for example there is no diversity among the organisms itself all will look like same and say for example can they be same no those organisms living in the polar region should be different those organisms living in the high temperate region should be different because in the polar region they'll have lot of fur those organisms can those organisms living in a high temperature region or temperate region can have that can have that amount of fur no it will not survive so there, that is why less diversity can lead to uniformity which is a problem in the long term as it is as it is unlikely that an individual in a population would be able to adapt to changing conditions so in order for an organism to adapt itself to its particular environmental habitat genetic diversity is very very important next talking about species diversity so species diversity is defined as the number of species and abundance of each of these species that live in a particular location so for example species of a butterfly species of a tiger species of a cat so like that so different types of species in that particular location or the difference in the species in that particular location we call it as the species diversity so talking about the importance of species diversity so species diversity is actually more important when compared to genetic diversity and ecosystem diversity why because species diversity is easier to work with ecosystem diversity means you'll have to consider a large area to do research on an organism it is quite laborious but this genetic diversity means you have to isolate a large number of genes completely study the genes and all that which is expensive and also quite time consuming and laborious but species diversity means you just choose a particular kind of species only on that say for example there are different types of monkeys right those which belongs to the primate like we have uh, under primates we have langur we have uh, the rhesus macaque that is a common monkey that is there and under primates itself we have human beings so we are different species so say for example you need to study about langur you can just concentrate only on langur it is limited so that is why species diversity is easier to work with and therefore species diversity is more important when compared to the genetic diversity and the ecosystem diversity 
and species diversity is easy to identify by eyes in the field. Say for example, I told you, we are all primates, monkeys, apes, then langur, then uh, human beings, we are all primates, but we are different species, right? How can you say that we are different species? Just by looking. By looking you can say, right, this is a langur, this is a ape, this is a gorilla, this is a human being. So therefore it is easy to study them, whereas genetic diversity, you have to bring the organism to the lab, you have to isolate the DNA, from the DNA you have to take out the gene, that gene you need to sequence, in that there will be thousands to thousands of genes, each of the gene you have to study separately, what type of protein it produces you have to study separately, so it's quite a laborious process. That is why species are relatively easy to identify by a naked eye itself in the field itself by looking at its morphology or external characters rather than going in for genetic diversity which requires a laboratory and lot of equipments and it is quite costly also to study because it needs a lot of time and resources to identify Whereas ecosystem diversity also, it needs a lot of measurements to be taken and when you go in for ecosystem diversity, you have to study in a larger area. So that is when it will take a longer period of time, it can take many years of time to do that. So that is why species diversity is more preferred for studying biodiversity in rather than going in for genetic and ecosystem diversity. And species are also easier to conceptualize and have been the basis for much of the evolutionary and ecological research because say for example I told you human beings and the monkeys we have monkeys also have five digits that is five fingers and five toenails even we also have five fingers and five toenails and to look at a skull structure also it is almost one and the similar our feeding habits are also one and the similar the intelligence also to some extent it is said to be one and the similar so all that similarities actually has made the scientists think that there might be a relationship between the humans and the monkeys wherein they went in for studying about it, right? That is how by just by looking it is easy to conceptualize the species diversity when compared to genetic and ecosystem diversity. So this is the importance of species diversity. Next talking about ecosystem diversity. So ecosystem diversity is defined as the variety of different habitats, communities and ecological processes. So different organisms live in different habitats. In that habitat a lot of variations will be there. All that and based on those variations only some of the organisms will have their own structural features for them to adapt to that particular situation. So that is nothing but ecosystem diversity, wherein the variety of different habitats, communities and ecological processes are seen. Next, talking about the importance of ecosystem diversity. As I told you, each ecosystem has its own kind of habitat. Like in an ecosystem, we have aquatic habitat. Those organisms living in aquatic habitat are completely different from those that are living in the terrestrial habitat, those which are living in the avian habitat. So it's completely different. Those uh, organisms living in on the land, do they have wings? No. Only those organisms which fly which live as uh, that is avian creatures or the birds have wings right those organisms living on the land do they have gills for breathing no only those which are living in water have gills for breathing so like that there are some variations and it is very very vast so it is time consuming also so each ecosystem provides much different kind of habitat or living place providing a home for myriad of species and different species have different roles to play in ecosystem. They have different functional roles to play in the ecosystem. And these roles that they play help in maintaining the characteristics of those particular organism which is unique to the ecosystem. Of course, that's true, right? So those organisms which play a very important role in decomposition in an ecosystem, they have a different kind of body structure there. They are completely different. So like that each organism depending on the role they play in the environment, their body structure and everything tends to vary. So this is about 
the importance of ecosystem diversity. Next, let's talk about the biogeography zones of India. So, what are biogeography zones? So, biogeographic regions or zones, they are the geographical areas that are defined based on the species found in them. So, based on what kind of species, species is living in a particular habitat, based on that, India is divided into different biogeographic zones. So, what are the different biogeographic zones in India? Let's study about it. So, we have the Trans-Himalayan region, then comes the Himalayan region, the semi-arid region, the Gangetic Plains, the desert, the northeastern region, the Deccan Peninsula, the coastal region, the western Ghats and the island which consists of the Andaman and Nicobar Island. So, these are the 10 different biogeographic zones in India. How did they classify them? Talking about the Himalayan region. Himalayan region organisms are completely different. The plant is completely different when compared to the desert region, right? So, now we have understood. Based on what type of organism and based on the habitat, actually these biogeographic regions are divided. Talking about each of these biogeographic zones. First is the Trans-Himalayan zone. So, it is present in the northernmost part of India. So, the northernmost region of India, which is an extension of Tibetan plateau surrounding the Himalayas form the Trans-Himalayan zone and this zone is quite rocky. It is made up of bare rock and glaciers. Therefore, because it consists of bare rock and glaciers, vegetation is very very poor in this particular region. So, obviously if the vegetation is poor, the herbivorous animal will be less or not, it will not be there at all. And likewise, carnivores also will be completely absent in this particular region. So, vegetation in this region is quite very poor or scanty because of the extreme climate. So, they have uh, very long winters and the summers are very, very short. That is why the vegetation is very, very scanty. Why? Because in winters, not much amount of sunlight is got, but we know that sunlight is very, very important for plants to synthesize food. And here, what happens here is the summers are very, very short. Therefore, it's not favorable for the plant. So, that is why vegetation is there, but it is very, very less. But in spite of that, they have a large population of wild sheep and goat. And this region is also famous for or home for the snow leopard, the black and brown bears, the wolf, marmots, marbled cat, ibex, kiang and also this, re this region is quite famous for the migratory black-necked crane. So, these are the common animals which are found here. Snow leopard, can you find them anywhere else? No. Why? Because these leopards are meant to live in rocky and glacier region such as the Trans-Himalayan zone. But other regions, they cannot survive there. So, like this, based on the habitat and based on the type of animals that are living there and type of plants, vegetation that is there, the zones are divided. So, next talking about the Himalayan zone. So, Himalayan zone, it is part of the Himalayas that lies within India and this Himalayan zone forms a junction between the Trans-Himalayan zone and the Northeast zone and this Himalayan zone is said to be the major provider of fresh water because all the rivers that flows throughout India, the water is said to come from the Himalayan zone. And this region is quite rich in flora, that is plant population, which covers the alpine, the subalpine and the moist deciduous forest. And also it has a lot of animal species because it is rich in plant species such as Baral, Ibex, Himalayan Thar, Takin, Markor, Hangal, Musk Deer, etc. And this diversity is because of it has a very good climate that is tropical, temperate and tundra climate. All the three climatic conditions are found in the Himalayan zone because they have different types of forest layers here such as alpine, subalpine and moist deciduous forest. That is why they are rich in flora and fauna. Next talking about the desert zone. So desert means 
they are completely arid or dry right with scanty rainfall or very very less negligible amounts of rainfall so rajasthan is actually the desert zone of india and 60% of the desert is present in rajasthan and that extends towards gujarat punjab and haryana also and this is a completely arid that is dry region and it receives a low annual rainfall every year the rainfall that they receive is very very low and therefore the vegetation is a scrub vegetation with lots of grasslands and therefore a lot of herbivores are found here such as usually the deer kind of animals like the blackbirds the gazelles partridges then birds like quail the great bustard and also some migratory birds such as the sand grouse ducks and geese so geese ducks and all that can you find it in the trans himalayan or himalayan region no so that is how each zone has its own set of animals living in that particular habitat next is semi arid zone semi arid zone is almost like desert only but it is a bit uh, better than desert because it receives a bit more rainfall when compared to that of the desert so these regions are not completely dry like the desert zone because they receive a little more rainfall when compared to the desert region because the northeast or the southeast monsoon rains do not reach them regularly in required quantity very rarely they reach them and if they reach them the rainfall is good not that good but better when compared to the desert so these regions they actually share a common border so that border wherein uh, thar desert extending into rajasthan the punjab and north gujarat in the north and other parts in the rain shadow of the western ghats covering states of maharashtra karnataka and tamil nadu so wherever the desert stretches so that border region so it is not like completely it's not a forest area completely it's not a desert area but they have a lot of scrublands present here so that is about the semi arid zone and the vegetation in the semi arid zone they usually thorny they contain lot of thorny plants and they have a dry deciduous forest and they also have a moisture forest and they also have mangroves so mangroves are nothing but marshes so they also have marshes and uh, the plant species include acacia all these plant species which are capable of surviving in very less amount of water acacia prosopis calotropis then gymnosporia euphorbia etc all these are the plants which have thorns in them and uh, gir forest that is in gujarat it actually comes under this particular semi arid zone itself and it is home for lions and these lions are endemic to that particular region because lions you don't find them anywhere else other than the gir forest which is a semi arid zone next talking about the western ghat zone so only 5% of india's land is covered by western ghat when compared to all the other zone but in spite of only 5% of india's land made up of western ghat it has a large, it is very very important because it gets good amount of rainfall that is it is a rain forest therefore a lot of uh, plant and animal species are found here which you can find nowhere else in the world and but in spite of having a very small area it houses a large number of flora and fauna that is plant and animal species and therefore it is considered as a global biodiversity hotspot because they are rich in lot of plants and animals why are they rich in lot of plants and animals because the climate is that good they have a humid tropical monsoon climate most of the time the climate is humid with lots of rainfall and um, this western ghat zone is also called as sayadri so sayadri is a sanskrit word which means chain of forested mountains so this western ghats it runs uh, from the coast of uh, gujarat to southern kerala so right from the coast of gujarat to southern, southern kerala it is a stretch of mountains and it has a very good population of plants and animals it is very rich so that is why it is uh, named as 
Sahyadri that is stretch of mountains. Next talking about the Deccan Plateau zone. So Deccan Plateau it is actually the largest plateau in southern India and it is located between the western and eastern Ghats and it covers almost 43% of India's total land surface. So therefore it is the largest zone in India especially it is situated towards the southern India and majority of the southern parts like uh, Maharashtra, then Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Tamil Nadu and Kerala all these come under the Deccan Plateau zone and the word Deccan is derived from the par Prakrit word which means Dakin meaning south and hence the plateau of the south. So it is the plateau of the south. So south is the region of India which has this Deccan plateau and it looks like an inverted triangle rising to an elevation of about 1000 meters in the south to about 550 sorry to about 500 meter in the north. So this is about the Deccan plateau. And the Deccan Plateau climate, it has a semi-arid climate in the northern parts of the Deccan Plateau. And uh, the southern part or other areas have a tropical climate with enough amount of rainfall. And therefore, they can have very dry and hot summers. And also when it is rainy season, they will receive a fair amount of rainfall which is enough for all the plants and animals to thrive properly or survive properly. And the forest that are there in the Deccan Plateau, it is said to be older than the Himalayas and therefore it is home to a wide variety of plants and animals which you can find nowhere else in the world. Next talking about the Gangetic Plains. So Gangetic Plains, it is also called the North Indian Plain. So Deccan Plateau is found in the south, Gangetic Plains are found in the north. So it actually extends from eastern Rajasthan, Rajasthan passing through Uttar Pradesh into Bihar and West Bengal and this particular Gangetic Plain zone mostly consists of agricultural lands because they get enough amount of water from the river Ganges and also whatever soil the Ganges river deposits during its course of flow that is quite fertile, it is alluvial rich and therefore which it is quite suitable for agriculture as, as they have rich alluvial soil which is deposited by the Ganges and its tributaries flowing through these regions and uh, not just that, they also have abundant uh, lots of underground water and these areas are quite plain and flattened. That is, they don't have mountain ranges and all that. Therefore, it is quite suitable for agriculture. And they are, don't have much trees making them suitable lands for agriculture. And uh, they have tropical dry deciduous forest, littoral forest. Littoral forest means um, with lots of fertile soil. Littoral forest and mangrove regions, that is marshy regions of the Sundarbans. Sundarbans, we all know because it is famous for tigers, right? So, mangrove regions of the Sundarbans and they are rich in flora and fauna. Next, talking about the northeast zone. So, about 8% of the country's geographical area is constituted by this particular zone and it overlaps between the Indian, Indo-Malayan and Indo-Chinese biogeographical regions and is a meeting point for the Himalayan mountains and the peninsula India. And more than 60% of this area is covered by forest and hence it houses a large number of flora and fauna because the climate is very very good with humid subtropical climate wherein they have hot, humid summers and very severe rainfall during the monsoons and the winter is also quite mild. So therefore, plant species population is quite high. Therefore, the animal population is also quite high and it is a home for a lot of orchids and epiphytes. So epiphytes are plants which grow on other plants, on the trees and all that. 
so uh, especially meghalaya region and all that if you visit no they all come under the northeast zone only you find uh, national parks wherein they completely have uh, orchids and epiphytes it's so beautiful to visit those areas next is the coastal zone so india actually has the so coastal zone also lies towards the southern part of india itself northern part doesn't have any coastal zone so india has nine coastal zones gujarat maharashtra goa karnataka kerala tamil nadu and andhra pradesh odisha west bengal and it is divided as west coast then malabar coast so malabar coast konkan coast then east coast koramandal coast and northern sarkars and it has a total area of about 7516.6 km and this particular coastal area is rich in mangrove vegetation therefore it is a home for a lot of aquatic that is water living plant species and animal species that is aqua flora and aqua fauna as well and it houses the highest number of tiger population that is the sundarban sundarbans can also come under the coastal zone a part of sundarban can come under the coastal zone as well and it houses a lot of tigers and also the bay of bengal it is home for different species of turtles as well so tiger population is more in the sundarbans and uh, uh, when compared to other regions of india next talking about the islands so the major island groups of india are the andaman which lies towards the north and nicobar towards the south that is in bay of bengal and lakshadweep island in arabian sea and these islands they have some best preserved evergreen forest of india as these islands they usually receive very heavy rainfall because of the northeast and the southeast monsoons and they also have coral reefs because nowhere else you can find coral reefs rather than these three islands that is andaman nicobar and lakshadweep islands and we all know that coral reefs they have their own special ecosystem wherein millions of millions of species are there which have not yet been discovered and it is the only region that is inhabited by large forest birds with big beaks so nowhere else in the other zones you can find birds which are very large with big beaks and all that it is only found in these island regions like uh, the narkon dam and uh, also it is a home for a lot of avifauna that is organisms living in water and animals living in water and also home to a lot of reptile species and andaman water snake that is there are found only in these islands and you cannot find them in any of the zones around the around india and andaman water snake are found only in these zones and nowhere else in any other zone so this was about the session wherein we studied about the biodiversity wherein we learned that biodiversity is studied at the three levels that is species diversity genetic diversity and ecosystem diversity and the species diversity is the most common study level of biodiversity and also we learned about the biogeo based on the species diversity based on what type of organisms live in different regions of india india is divided into 10 biogeographical zones and all those biogeographical zones we studied so in the next coming session we shall concentrate on biodiversity patterns that is two patterns of biodiversity are there that will study in the coming session and also we shall study about the global biodiversity hotspots so this we shall do in the next session so i hope you understood the session well we shall meet again in the coming session with these two topics thank you